again and welcome to Sunday service. This is July 4th, the Independence Day for America and the birthday of Ananda. I'll read from Rays of the One Light. Uh, these are weekly commentaries on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Abiding in God. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Yogananda often emphasized, more often to his disciples than to the general public, but also to everyone generally, for it was a universal teaching, the importance of attunement for divine understanding cannot be created. It must be perceived. To the disciples, Yogananda spoke of the importance of attunement with the guru. To others, he urged the importance at least of attuning oneself to higher consciousness. Can an eagle rise without support from the sustaining air? Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same shall bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. How can we abide in him? Jesus says, 
if my words abide in you. By words, he meant not only his spoken words, but his vibrations, his consciousness, of which the words are only an expression. We must abide by the teachings, but we must also absorb those teachings into ourselves, that they become our own experience. For disciples of this path, the more in their hearts they live consciously in the presence of the masters, the more they will find the divine presence living within them. And for all truth seekers, whether disciples or not, the more they live sustained inwardly by the awareness of God's presence, the higher they will find themselves soaring in wisdom and joy. For the Bhagavad Gita says in the 10th chapter, I am the source of everything. From me, all creation emerges. Blessed with this realization, the wise, awe-stricken, adore me. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, <clears throat> Om, Om. Well, good morning, everyone. And I, too, want to welcome you to our Sunday service. And it's uh, always such a special time. Both, it's a quadruply blessed day, the end of Sunday service, uh, the end of Spiritual Renewal Week, Sunday service, Gautamata's birthday, and Ananda Village's birthday. And I should add, my spiritual birthday, because this is 4th of July, 1969, is when I came to Ananda. So let's read a brief passage from Whispers from Eternity by Paramahansa Yogananda. This is number 111. Demand to find God at any time, anywhere. Teach me, O oh Father, to find thee in the cave of my heart, that I may walk with thee everywhere. Teach me to hear thee in silence, that I may hear thy voice beneath outer noises. Teach me to find thee in inner peace, that I may be with thee calmly in the midst of outer tumult, hubbub or silence, tumult or peace. I care not, so long as thou wilt teach me to find thee anywhere, at any time. So, this is such a beautiful passage that we have this week from the Bible and the Gita. And it's so appropriate for the end of Spiritual Renewal Week and for Ananda's birthday. Because really what we've been talking about all week in many different ways, and I still hear the beautiful music and the beautiful inspiration from devoted souls reverberating in this room, little whispers from eternity, and all the talks that Swami gave and the teachings Master brought us, they're all with us. But it speaks of the, Christ uses the image of the, bran the branch coming off the vine, the vine is God, Guru, and we are but the branches. And this is what gives our life power and purpose and meaning and fulfillment, that connection with a greater reality, the vine and the branch. And in the reading, Swami makes two very important points, and I want to delve into these a little deeper. The first one is that it's not enough to hear lectures. It's not enough to read books. But you must absorb them into yourself. You must experience them 
personally. And if we do this, then that's where the attunement comes. People can quote all sorts of scriptures. They can refer to obscure passages and erudite books. But if they're not living them, what good is any of it? There's a beautiful story from the life of St. Francis of Assisi, one of the great, great saints of Christianity. And Master called him his patron saint. And he, Master actually visited Assisi when he was in Europe, 1935-36. Uh, and he said, um, on the little forest pass of Lerimo, many of us have been there, he said, well, he said, I felt Christ everywhere in Assisi, but on the little forest paths of Lerimo, I felt him, I saw him walking by my side. And St. Francis was a saint of humility, of renunciation, of joy, of total self-offering. And he, he really gave a new birth to the Catholic Church, which at that time had fallen into, like perhaps present times, had fallen into rigidity, uh, power, bureaucracy, and the inspiration was gone. And this simple little monk, simple little young man with such love for God, he returned the spirit of Christ to that church. And at a certain point in his life, um, he, was, he would wander from town to town begging. All he had were his little threadbare robes, a little begging bowl, but he had a Bible and he would read the words of his beloved Christ every day, every evening. And one day in his wanderings, he spied along the side of the road an old beggar woman. She was broken down, her body was old, and she no longer could work. And she, she could barely see, but she kind of heard someone walking by on the road, not realizing that he had nothing more than she did. And she said to him, sir, can you give me something? And Francis looked at what he had, and all he had was his begging bowl and his Bible. He needed his begging bowl to get food to eat. And so he gave her his beloved Bible. And then that night he came back to the little cave where he was staying and he was weeping. And he said, Lord, I can't even read your word now. I've given away even that. And Christ appeared to him and said, my child, you don't need the words on paper. My words are written in your heart. And that's what it means to be in tune. You don't need to read books. You don't need to read the written word at a certain point. In the beginning, it's good. But just to be able to know that the living word of God and Guru radiate from your own heart, this is what we all need to do. Listen to a talk by Master or Swamiji. Read their words, but then live it. Apply it in your own life until you know what they're talking about. Otherwise, it's just sea foam on the surface. And then the second point, which is of equally great importance, Swamiji says in the reading, to abide in God means to live always in his presence, in the thought of him, of God and then to realize that by you living in his presence, his living presence dwells within you. And Swami Kriyananda was such a beautiful example of this because there were so many moments we were with him over the years and his mind was always on Master. Once Jatish and I, this was towards the end of Swami's life, maybe in the last five years. We were walking with him in the lower garden of the Hermitage, and all of a sudden he stopped. And he said, oh, that's what he meant. And we didn't know what he was talking about. 
And he said, I remember Master said something, and a small group of us monks were in his presence, and he was looking at one monk, but he raised his eyebrow in such a way he was saying it to me. Now I understand. That event probably happened 50 years prior, but he was always thinking, always thinking of the Master. And that's why Master was able to flow through him, through his music, through his books, through his uh, lectures, through his divine love for all of us, and through building communities. I remember some years ago, there was a spiritual teacher from India who was visiting, and we were showing him around. And of course, people are always impressed when they come to Ananda. And I think, really, it's not what they see with their eyes. It's what they feel. But they don't realize that just at first. And this man, this spiritual teacher, a very fine, fine man, has a big following. He walked around, and he, he said, oh, what a lot of tapasya Swami Kriyananda has done to create this place. And that was true on one level. Because indeed, Swami was a total life offering and sacrifice to create Ananda. But another visitor came a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago. His name was Swami Shankarananda. He was, again, from India. But he was part of our lineage. He was a disciple of a direct disciple of Sri Yukteswar. And he has a beautiful Kriya Yoga ashram up in Rishikesh. And Swami Shankarananda understood it more deeply. He looked around and looked around. And he said, I don't understand how Swami Kriyananda could have done this. And then he paused and he said, oh. Yes, I do understand. He didn't do it, but his guru through him did it. And that's the point. We need to understand that it's when our minds are always with God, then the master can act through us. And miracles can happen. That Ananda exists is a miracle. And if our little branch we're not connected to the vine, as it said in that reading from the Bible. It would have been cut off long ago and burnt up. But look what has happened here at Ananda. Just to, since we're celebrating our 52nd anniversary, let's look at some of the things. I mean, there was, of course, the fire that we talk about all the time, 1976. But at that, just if to free, to kind of put it in context, everything burnt down. We had no insurance. We had no income source. We had no place to live. A few people still, their houses weren't affected, but the vast majority of us had nothing. And still, we persisted. We just didn't miss a beat. We just kept, and once we were in the rebuilding phase, there was a, a young man who was a skilled carpenter, Bindu, who just passed away. Bindu, may your soul feel God's blessings. He was an old man by this time. And Bindu, we were rebuilding, and we were unskilled. We didn't know what we were doing to rebuild these homes. And at the end of the day, we had to tear out. We were further behind than when we started, <laughs> because we had to tear out everything they'd done. And Bindu just said, let's remember, we're not building houses. We're building character. And that's what it was. We were building strength and purpose. And we persisted. And I don't know how we survived, really. I mean, we had, I don't know how we bought food. I don't know how we, I really don't. Because there was no money. There was no place to live. But we persisted. And then you roll the clock a little bit forward. forward. We come to 1990. And Ananda's hit with a terrible lawsuit on copyright issues and to try to pull our name down and besmirch Swamiji. And this went on for 12 years and millions of dollars this cost. And yet, 
Still, we persisted, and we remained bloodied indeed, but unbowed, unbowed. And I remember when it was all over, we had a celebration. This was before the temple existed, this temple. We were in the teaching temple at the Expanding Light, and the main lawyers came to celebrate with us. John Parsons, Rob Christopher, of Christopher Farms Garlic. By the way, we always buy his garlic. That was his family's business. But they were wonderful men, wonderful men. And those two particularly, they were crying. I've never seen, can you imagine lawyers crying? But there they were. And John Parsons, who became a very dear friend, is a very dear friend, he wrote the beautiful book about the lawsuit, The Fight for Religious Freedom. And he said, I'll never forget his words. He said, so many, and, and John and Latika and Keshava uh, Taylor from India now, they spent many all-nighters, many all-nighters in Nidruva trying to get a brief ready or get, prepare some papers. And John said at this celebration, he said, there were so many times when I lost heart where I thought, how can we keep fighting this battle? They have so much more money than we do. They have so much more, many more lawyers than we do. And John said, but I would just, I would look in the eyes of the Ananda people, and I knew we could win. And he said, I expected at certain points that all this would be gone. It would be rolled over and plowed up, but still we persisted. And here we are today. And then it, Italy, 2004, Jatish and I had gone over to do the Maha Samadhi celebration for Master, March 7th, 2004. What happens? The event was supposed to start on a Friday night, go through Sunday. Wednesday afternoon, the police come. There's a lawsuit against Ananda. You all, many of you saw beautiful Kirtani, saintly soul. She was accused of being a front for the mafia. Okay. We were accused of income tax evasion, which was not true. And the Karma Yoga program, which they have here, we have her, was accused of being a slave labor camp. So this is what we were fighting against. And to make it worse, they arrested Kirtani, Shivani, Anand, Gitanjali, the head of their choir, they were put in literally a dungeon, a medieval Italian prison. And they were trying to scare us. And people were saying, oh, we can't, the event was not scheduled at Assisi. It was scheduled uh, in a beautiful big hotel in downtown Assisi, so many people could come. And people were saying, oh, we can't do the event. We can't do the event. And, you know, it's too blah, 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 blah. And we just held ourselves. And <laughs> Jatish and I said, we'll teach all the classes. We'll sing in the choir <laughs> because there's nobody else. <laughs> we will do this event no matter what. And I'll never forget one of the highlights of my life. We were standing on the stage. The choir was behind us. We were about to start giving Sunday service. And our beloved friend Nandini comes running on the stage. And she said, they've been released. They've been released from prison. And the choir, I'm giving goosebumps as I tell this, the choir all broke out into the song, Brave Are the People That Lived in These Hills. And we just sang it and sang it. And then we went out on the street because they were driving them by in police cars to go back to Assisi because they were still under house arrest because, you know, Kirtani might have been a friend for the mafia. <laughs> so, and we went out on either side of the street that they were, and, they were driving by this hotel, and we sang, brave are the people, as they drove by. We persisted still. And then we come to move forward 2020 India. The pandemic hits, 2020 and 21, with a vengeance. And all of our leaders are 
trying to give support and strength and energy to their people. And it's not a joke. Many, many of our people, a part of Ananda, either relatives or friends or close ones, passed away. Many lost their jobs and had no income source. But our people held their ground as we saw Diana speak yesterday. She said, I, people were saying, Diana said yesterday, people were saying to me, why don't you go back to America where it's safe? Diana and Jaya are the co-directors of Ananda India. And Diana said, why would I want to leave India? I am in the light. I am connected to the vine. I am, the, I am a branch off the vine. I am in the light. Where else would I need to go? Why would I need to go? And so they are persisting. And here we are today, speaking all this week about the road ahead. But looking at our history, don't you know? Can't you see? We have nothing to fear. No matter what happens, we will persist because we are the branch and the vine is sustaining us. All that's sustaining us is that vine. I hate to break it to you, but it's not unemployment, it's not small business loans, it's the vine that's sustaining us. And that's what's feeding outward. And we need to remember always that what's the fruit of the vine? The grape. And what does the grape represent according to our teachings? Divine love. That's the, the vine, the little branch that Ananda is. And we are the little grapes, the little bubbles of joy, the little <laughs> bubbles of divine love. And that's in that sense, that's what we have to offer the world, that sweetness, that divine love, that beautiful harvest of the vine, that divine love. And so, Ananda, we all know it means bliss. This is the fruit. This is where we live. God has given us, through Master and Swami, to live in Ananda. Whether you live in one of our communities, in our virtual community, or just sympathetic in your heart. We live in Ananda. And the more we can remember that, the more the future becomes, the road ahead becomes a shining pathway to all we are seeking, past all darkness, past all suffering, past all regrets and guilt of the past, but just that shining light of Ananda, and this is where we will abide forever if we remember our little tendril coming from the vine of God and Guru. God bless you. <clears throat>
Is love? What is love? Is it love? 